having his own house in Jerusalem, uh, there's a reasonable sketch of the type of architecture that it would have mimicked. So uh, this should be uh, interesting for you to read, and uh, a whole different type of reading from having read the first 14 or 15 chapters of, of First Nephi. So that's, uh, that's what you're going to be doing outside of class this week, and now let's, uh, let's start in with the fun stuff. Last week, this is particularly germane for those of you that, uh, that weren't here last week, I introduced the notion that the Book of Mormon is actually two different books. And you will read about this in your syllabus, so I won't repeat that whole uh, uh, issue. But, um, and now it looks like this wants to uh, flip all my slides around. Oh, good for that. Uh, but we've tried to point out that the small plates of Nephi uh, are very different in all kinds of ways. The century in which they were produced, the uh, languages of origin, the author's um, uh, social and, and linguistic and even religious background. Um, and we pointed out that even in terms of our own LDS history, the, um, the uh, chapters that we know as 1st Nephi, 2nd Nephi, Jacob, Enos, Jerem, are not technically the Book of Mormon in terms of what the Book of Mormon really was, that, that work authored by Mormon and Moroni. And that when Joseph Smith was told to uh, replace the translation on the 116 lost pages with this alternative material from the plates of Nephi, Joseph Smith was told to publish it as the record of Nephi. In other words, it's something entirely different from the Book of Mormon. So within the covers of our present Book of Mormon, there are actually two different books. One is a more of an ancient Near Eastern record, written by authentic, you know, uh, natives of the, of the Near East, most of it written by Nephi and Jacob, Hebrew speakers, you know, in the sixth century BC. And the other one is from the 4th century AD by authentic Native Americans who were separate from Nephi by 900 years. Now, I, I said that uh, even though we don't make that differentiation so clearly in our own Book of Mormon, that in the original edition, um, uh, that thing, the distinction was made in terms of Joseph Smith following the commandment of the Lord. Because in section 10, the Lord had said, you shall publish that information as the record of Nephi. I mentioned to you that on, in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith actually explained this in a uh, special uh, introduction. Now, this is my facsimile edition of the 1830 original edition of the Book of Mormon. I'll pass this around. I got this as a wedding gift in 1980, uh, or, or actually as a birthday gift from my new wife, Kim, back in 1980. And it uh, was a project of the church for the 150th anniversary of the organization of the church to do a facsimile publication of the first edition. So this is kind of a, a, a real treasure that I have because you it's, it's kind of hard to get these anymore, at least from the 1980 uh, sesquicentennial celebration. But there's that preface right up front, okay, before you get to the first page of First Nephi. And in that preface, Joseph Smith explained that somebody had stolen his translation of Moroni's, or pardon me, Mormon's Book of Lehi. And that the Lord had then showed him that in the collection of plates, he could go to this other thing and translate actually a first-person account from Nephi and more or less substitute that in. So he explained that to the reader in this preface. To the reader. And a lot of false reports have been circulated about this following work and blah, 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 blah. So I would tell you that uh, I translated by the gift of the power of God and caused to be written 116 pages, which I took from the book of Lehi, which was an account of bridge from the plates of Lehi by the hand of Mormon, which said account some person or persons have stolen from me, notwithstanding my utmost exertions to recover it again. And being commanded of the Lord, I should not translate the same again, for Satan put in their hearts to tempt the Lord their God by altering the words they did read contrary from that way. It's just quoting section. Um, uh, uh, the Lord said, uh, uh, um, uh, you shall translate from the plates of Nephi until you come to that which you have translated, meaning the Bath Mosiah, which you have retained. He's really just quoting the revelation here that we call section 10. And, pardon me while I flip the next page, behold, you shall publish it as the record of Nephi. And thus will I confound those who have altered my words signed the author. And of course, he wasn't really the author, but he was the English translator. 
So Joseph Smith did fulfill the commandment in section 10 to publish what you know as 1st, 2nd Nephi, Jacob, Venus, Jerem, Amna, as the record of Nephi. He made a special, you know, attempt right there to, to identify that. That explanation, that preface has never occurred in any other edition of the book So you kind of have to know that, that, that Joseph did keep that commandment with the original edition, and that's kind of nice. Uh, and I mention that only because we made such an issue that the Book of Mormon is really two different books like this. But I wanted to show you that, and I had not brought the book with you. Okay, questions, comments on this? How many of you have actually seen and, and, and leafed through uh, a first edition of the Book of Mormon? Has anybody done that? I have had the opportunity, not with a, a replica, but a real one. It's like holding the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the most remarkable thing. Did you want to comment on it? Um, no, I just, I would extend the question. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, in the library? Uh, that's really, that's, that's a superb experience, I think. Well, okay, then um, let's do this. Today, tonight, um, in the hour remaining to us, hour and 50 minutes, I'd like to take you out into uh, Jerusalem. This will be our first kind of field trip out into the uh, out into the city, vicariously here. And when I teach at the Jerusalem Center, um, which is well, uh, turned out to be much more frequently in my life than I ever thought it, it would be. I've got 19 programs there. Um, I uh, I have the students instead of writing a research paper in the library, which is a place people go to die. <laughs> I have them do their research project in the city. They have to get out in the city and visit, what would you say, a uh, uh, hundred places? I, I can't remember exactly, but it's just like takes the whole semester to go and visit everything in Jerusalem that I put on the list. And the list is like three pages long. Uh, but I feel that's a much better um, way to do a research project if you're in Jerusalem. Is not to stay in a building in the library, to, but to get out and, and let the city be your, your library. And so, uh, in addition to the field trips um, out into the city of Jerusalem that we take as a, as a program, uh, my students have to explore 12 different areas of Jerusalem, old and new, uh, in a series of personal field study visits made throughout the semester, and they can, they can decide when they go to what areas, but the areas are designated, and, and um, uh, I feel that that's the only way to get to know it, is to, is to actually get out there and get to know Jerusalem. Now, that's what I'd like to start with you tonight, at least in a little way, is let's go on uh, a kind of a visual trip and also with the, the benefit of understanding how Jerusalem developed, to see how it relates to Lehi. And, uh, and, and not only the question of uh, his house at Jerusalem, but the land of his inheritance. Um, what you're going to read in this book called Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem is um, uh, the preferred model, at least at this time, and, and it's the one that, that I have published too, that uh, you've got the land of inheritance of Lehi some distance to the north in what was the ancient tribal area of western Manasseh. Whereas Lehi himself is living in his house at Jerusalem. And tonight I want to take two or three minutes to kind of go through with you what you'll also read on one of the pages in the study as to why we can say uh, fairly safely that, that this represents the reality. Um, because if you're a little bit older of a Mormon, the way I am, you might have been taught something quite different when you were young, about how the, the geography of First Nephi fits together. And here's why, okay? Because of this guy, uh, the great Hugh Nibley, who was one of my teachers here, uh, he was one of my graduate instructors. I had my first experience with uh, Hugh Nibley in about this time, actually January of 1975. He wrote a book in 1952 which encompassed some of the research that he had been doing on the Book of Mormon as a student of the Near East, which he was, uh, called Lehi in the Desert and the World of the Jaredites. 
This is a picture of the paperback edition that was put out by uh, Deseret Press. And uh, this was his first kind of position on the question of Lehi's residence. And this is what he says. Though he dwelt at Jerusalem, using three words as a quote from verse 25, Lehi did not live in the city. Nimbly says. Why does he say this? Well, because uh, he notes that there is a land of inheritance. He says, for it was after they had failed to get the plates in Jerusalem, meaning the brass plates from Laban, that Lehi's sons decided to go down to the land of our father's inheritance and there gather enough wealth to buy the plates from Laban. So Nibli's assumption was that if the wealth of Lehi is in a certain place at the land of inheritance, that must be where Lehi lives. Now, by the way, it's wrong. But that's what he assumed. And he was a, a, a younger scholar in those days, but highly respected. And so he put out this book. And so people began teaching this. And they have taught this for decades. But you can still find this taught in some of the warmer classes because of, of Nibley's sort of classic book, uh, Lehi in the Desert. Um, this is, if you will, the uh, old idea. Uh, it's a kind of a tired old idea, really, that Lehi's house was somehow not in the city of Jerusalem but rather on the land uh, of his inheritance, out away from the city of Jerusalem. But how can you call that Jerusalem, if it's not in Jerusalem? Well, because you have this issue uh, in the Book of Mormon where you, you have a city named Jerusalem, and apparently the city resides in a kind of a greater geographical area that is known as the land of Jerusalem. So the, uh, the, um, uh, the speculation here was that, yeah, Lehi lives in the land of Jerusalem, but not in the city. His house is a ranch somewhere out on the land of Jerusalem. And by the way, that is the model that is, is the, um, the setting in a very popular modern novel series about the Book of Mormon that's out there, published by, not Deseret, but by Covenant. Um, it's wrong. And, and, the, the, and, and the, the novels get it wrong, too. They got Lehi's residence out somewhere in the land of Jerusalem. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like the Ponderosa, you know, with Lehi and Laman the Lemuel Sam, like Warren Green and the, the, the Cartwright boy. Uh, it's, it's a real thing. They actually farm horses out there, which is just not done in ancient Judah. Um, now, to Nibley's credit, I want to show you something that most of those who, who love this book don't pick up on. And that is that he changed his entire approach after a certain number of years. He actually abandoned this view that he had published. But the thing about Hugh was that he used to say, uh, anything I've written that's over five years old, I'm not going to stand behind because I keep learning new stuff. And I know how that feels because I've had that happen to me. His number two position on this question was published first in 1958 in another book called An Approach to the Book of Mormon. And by that time, he had reread the Book of Mormon a hundred times or so and actually noticed in the text that he had been wrong before. He paid more attention to the text this time than past. And Hugh says this, he, Lehi, had his own house at Jerusalem. Yet, he was accustomed to go forth from the city from time to time. So, so it's clear that he's, he's noting that Jerusalem is the city in this case. And his paternal estate, the land of his inheritance, okay, where the bulk of his fortune reposed, was some distance from the town. So here what Hugh did is he delinked the land of inheritance from the city. Okay, and, and, and the land of inheritance from his house. Here he's placing the house in the city of Jerusalem and his land of inheritance somewhere else. Okay. Now, here he has it right, but there's actually one more stage that you should go to to understand why it is that, uh, that we map it the way that I showed you a minute ago. And, and, and here it is. You have to do this in three stages. And you have to also know 
that um, in the Book of Mormon, there's a very standard uh, geographical framework in 1 Nephi, where when anyone is going to Jerusalem, they go up. That's the, that's the directional adverb that is used. And when they are leaving Jerusalem to go anywhere, whether it's to the Red Sea or the land of inheritance or anywhere else, if they're leaving Jerusalem, city or land, they go down. Now, some of you who've been to Israel and even studied there know why this is. Jerusalem is located in the tops of the Judean mountains at about 2,700 feet above sea level. And um, whether you go east or whether you go west, you're going down as you leave Jerusalem. Now, if you go north or south, say to Hebron or north to Bethel, you're more or less staying at the same elevation for a while. But the idiomatic usage of ancient Hebrew in the Bible was so strong about the notion of leaving Jerusalem to go down, that even if you were going north or south, they referred to it as going down. And that's weird because Hebron's actually a couple hundred feet higher in elevation than Jerusalem. When Jesus, for example, and then we're going now to the New Testament, goes to the Galilee from Jerusalem, he's going north, but the idiom in the New Testament is he goes down. And then you remember the famous parable a certain man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho and fell among thieves. This is the kind of language you find in the Bible that reflects the real geography of Jerusalem. And this is exactly the language that Nephi uses. Whenever you're going to Jerusalem, they're going up. Whenever you're leaving Jerusalem, you're going down. Now, how would Joseph Smith have known this? Because when he's producing the Book of Mormon, he's definitely not a Bible scholar. Um, and, and, and no one in his day, and no one really until the 20th century, was reading the Bible in any systematic way to, to, um, to study geography. So these types of things just weren't in the commentaries in his day. And certainly he wouldn't have noticed that language in the Bible to try and mimic it in the Book of Mormon. Uh, besides that, he didn't know anything about Jerusalem. To understand the, the terrain and the topography. And so the language that we have in 1 Nephi can't be invented language by Joseph Smith. It's the real translation of a real of, of real linguistic expressions from a person who lived in Jerusalem, Nephi. And because Nephi lived at Jerusalem, and because he was a Jew, and because he understood the way that the <coughs> geography works, in his passing comments about travel. He notes that you have to go up to Jerusalem and you go down from Jerusalem. So look at this in three steps, okay? Step one is in 1 Nephi 3 9. When Lehi asks the boys to go from the Red Sea, Valley of Lemuel, back to Jerusalem to get the plates of Laban, which, by the way, is a 250 mile trip, and it takes two weeks of walking through the desert to make this trip from the Valley of Lemuel back to Jerusalem. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that aspect another week, the, the, the trek to the Red Sea. Uh, but when they do, Nephi notes that they go up to Jerusalem. Then, when Laban won't give them the plates, Nephi notes in 1 Nephi 3, 16 through 22, that they go down to the land of inheritance to collect Lehi's silver and gold. Now, what the silver and gold is doing, not in Jerusalem, in Lehi's house, but dozens of miles away at a land of inheritance, is a question that we'll put on hold for a minute, but there's a really good substantive answer to it. But after they go uh, for what must have been probably a two-day journey to the land of inheritance and do what they need to do to get the gold and silver, my own thought is it was probably buried. <coughs> probably buried. Uh, I, 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 you'll read that I don't think we had a house on the land of inheritance. Maybe some Samaritans did. But um, I, I, I would suggest that probably the gold and silver was buried. Uh, 
I have excavated in Israel buried treasure. It's a most incredible thing to be digging beneath the floor of a building. This happened at Ekron, by the way. This was in the 1990s. And to see, coming up from beneath a, a, a flagstone floor, uh, in the soil below it, a pot, perfect and unbroken, with ingots of silver in it. This was their form of a wall safe, or I guess we should say a floor safe. They would bury it uh, under their floors. And we found these in the city of Ekron in the 1990s, two silver boards by ostensibly families who had tried to secure their silver by burying it beneath their flagstone floor in their house. But the Babylonians came in 604 BC and destroyed Ekron, and the family that was in that house never did survive to use their silver. So here's these guys digging it up in 1993. <laughs> um, Lehi, however, knew that Jerusalem was in danger. So he doesn't seem to have hidden his gold and silver underneath the floor of his house. Now maybe he had at some point his life, but it's clear that in the context of the Book of Mormon, uh, that is First Nephi, the, the, the gold and silver is not at his house in Jerusalem, but it's way away from the city Lehi knew would be destroyed. It's hidden safely, maybe beneath the roots of an olive tree, I don't know, uh, in, in the land of his inheritance. And so Nephi and Laman and Lemuel go and get this, and Sam too, and they return to Jerusalem to see if they can buy the plates. And what does the text say when they return from the land of inheritance to come to Jerusalem? They go back up again to the land of Jerusalem. So this three-stage reading exercise demonstrates to you that Lehi's house is not in the land of his inheritance. And it's not in the land of Jerusalem, because the land of inheritance is different from the land of Jerusalem. The land of Jerusalem you get to by going up. The land of inheritance you get to by going down from Jerusalem. That's the systematic way that you would solve a problem in the Book of Mormon is by carefully examining the text and, and using the information that we know from, from the land of Israel study. Now, I know for many of you this is a question that you had never dreamed existed, that you would never have thought of asking. Okay? That's my job. I answer questions that no one really asks. <laughs> But part of this is to demonstrate how remarkably accurate the record of Nephi is. It's a record that could not have been literally invented as fiction by anyone living in 1830, let alone a New York farm boy. This can only be from someone who A, was living in the 7th and 6th century BC, and who B, was a resident of this area and knew it well enough for all these details to just naturally come as passing comments in his narrative, namely Nephi of Jerusalem. Are you saying that before Lehi family left Jerusalem, they took their stuff and went up to the land of their inheritance and kept it safe, or is it because he came from a generation, like the, he came down to get away from destruction up there, Well. I don't know. I don't know where he gets the treasure. My guess is that probably it's money that he Lehi has made in the business that he runs, but that he's hiding it there for a specific purpose seems clear. If you open your text, and I don't think I put in a, um, I don't think I put in a uh, uh, that reference here, so I'm going to have to read it to you. Okay, go to um, go to First Nephi three and read sixteen and seventeen. Nephi tells Laman and Lemuel and Sam, hey, we gotta, we gotta leave Jeru and we gotta go to the land of inheritance and get the, get the gold and silver because it looks like we're gonna have to try to buy these plates. Right? So pick it up at 16. Wherefore, Nephi said, let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, let us go down to the land of our father's inheritance. For behold, he left gold and silver and all manner of riches, and all this hath he done because of the commandments of the Lord. Okay? So apparently, Lehi's hiding his wealth uh, due to revelation, okay? And then in verse 17, it tells you 
what the hey, how you doing? Good. Um, it tells you what the what the what the reason or or what the connected uh, logic is behind the revelation. Verse seventeen: For he knew that Jerusalem must be destroyed. Um, and so there's your there's your motive. If you, if you like a detective, I have motive. There it is, right there. It, Lehi knew through revelation that Jerusalem must be destroyed, and that anything left in Jerusalem is not safe. So he hides his stuff somewhere else. Now here's the here's the sad part of this: they lose it anyway. Right? Laban steals it, but then Laban loses something a little more utilitarian than gold, namely his head. So I suppose it's, you know, life is rough, and then you die. But uh, <laughs> He doesn't appear to know. He doesn't appear to know at this point. Um, and, and we could look at that. I, I won't stop to do that, but we can look at it. Where does he cast himself on his bed? In Jerusalem. Yeah, in First Nephi 1 it says he goes from where he was praying back into his house at Jerusalem and casts himself down on his bed. And that's the second revelation he received in First Nephi 1. The first one was the pillar of fire that dwelt on a rock, which last week I suggested was probably on the Mount of Olives, outside the wall of Jerusalem. But then, as if, you know, a vision of a, of a celestial pillar of light, and whoever's in that light speaking to him, isn't enough. That morning, he goes back and needs to take a nap, because that was a tiring experience, and he has another vision inside his house. Um, so I call it Levi's Big Day. <laughs> um, okay, so coming back to the to the map I flashed to you in the beginning, and this map actually appears in the in the reading that I sent you. Uh, here's where we would then uh, know Lehi's house in Jerusalem, and here, very likely for reasons you will read about, in the land of Manasseh, uh, the tribal <coughs> inheritance of, of Lehi would would be the most likely spot for. Uh, and why Western Manasseh rather than Eastern Manasseh across the Jordan River? You'll read why. Okay? Well, I'm only doing kind of a preview of part of, of what you're going to read this week. Okay. Lehi, by the way, is not identified as being of Manassite tribal heritage in the record of Nephi. And it's interesting that he's not, but he's not. We, the only reference to this in the whole Book of Mormon is actually in Alma, you know, on the place of Mormon, Alma 10.3. But that suffices for us to go ahead and, and add that into the mix. Was there other place that this would get abridged in, like that Mormon would have learned that about his well, no, 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 no. See, see, there were two. There were two sets of plates of Nephi, right? We have what we call the small plates, which are not small because they're three by five. Okay, they're the same size as as uh, as the large plates of Nephi. Okay, but the large plates of Nephi were the royal record, the one that King Nephi is writing about his people, and there he's given the background of his journey and, and the whole first part of that. Apparently, was called the Book of Lehi, and then after that the Book of Mosiah, and after that, the Book of Alma, okay? And this is the, these are the plates here, and they're large only because, like, the collection is larger, you know, there's lots of plates. And Mormon abridges from these, okay, from the royal record. This is Nephi's smaller collection, okay, and this is his personal prophetic record. And this is the one that, um, that uh, 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 when Mormon wrote his own plates, in the plates of Mormon, and, and he's abridging from these, right, and writing a story in an abridged form, he finds these, and he says, these are so cool, I'm just going to put these right in my loose sleep. And so, so that's the difference. Okay, now, where was Lee Hawks? Well, you might think, how could you know that? Actually, there's a lot of information in that little book that helps you to pinpoint some stuff. And while I wouldn't go out to where the branch becomes a twig, okay, I'll go pretty far out on that branch in suggesting that the likelihood is right about there. Now, what you're looking at is a big um, bronze model of Jerusalem 
at the end of the First Temple period, around 600 BC. And this bronze model is right there in front of our Jerusalem Center. So if you ever get to go there or you have been there, you, you know where that is and you know um, uh, what we do with it and how you can stand at that model here, look out this direction at the old city of Jerusalem and, and see it all right before your eyes. Are there people lived in Jerusalem at that um, I got that on here. Uh, I'll have a whole uh, population breakdown for you, so let me just defer to that for just a minute and you'll see it. Um, for a little while tonight, then let me just take you through how Jerusalem develops, because this kind of background will enable you to appreciate the reading more and will give you kind of the basic geographical understanding of Jerusalem that, that Nephi would have understood. Now, some of you that, that have been Jerusalem Center students, and especially if you were my Jerusalem Center students, this some is going to be a repeat for you, but I trust that you don't remember it all, so it should be okay. Um, as I say, I demand that people get out of our building and go walk around the city walls. Go understand the city in every component you possibly can. This is the west side of the old city of Jerusalem, the biblical city of Jerusalem. It's now a beautiful parkway where you can have picnics and play frisbee and all kinds of fun stuff and it's just really wonderful there's nothing quite like going out into Jerusalem for an adventure for the day it is the most extraordinary city on the face of the earth and I've been to a lot of extraordinary ones you know uh, Paris London etc and nothing beats Jerusalem um, the old city itself in terms of the diagrams that I'd like to use with you is shaped something like this if you were a bird and could see it from the air and this picture here is a shot right along this side of the wall, right there, is where you're looking. So let me go back. Chunk. Chunk. Right. Um, this is a gate. These little things are gates, and Joppa Gate is right up there, uh, about right there. And uh, this would be the ancient Temple Mount, the mountain of the house of the Lord, uh, which was the home of Solomon's Temple, and later the Temple Jesus knew the Temple. Herod, and then um, in the 7th century AD, after the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, they built the Dome of the Rock, which is what this octagonal shape represents, this is the site of the Dome of the Rock, which was the site of the ancient Temple of Solomon. And then you have uh, gates in the city walls, Dung Gate, uh, Zion's Gate, Joppa Gate, New Gate, Damascus, Herod's, Lion's Gate, and a closed gate we call Golden Gate. I mention those only so that uh, some of you who have, who have experienced this will, will have this um, if you were to look at um, Jerusalem from the air, and it was easier for me to do this with a, with a map than it was to just try to get a satellite shot of Jerusalem. Um, the old city today, that part which is the ancient part of Jerusalem, and you can see the outline of the old city walls, it's like um, less than a 50th of the land area of the modern city of Jerusalem. <coughs> Jerusalem has expanded hugely and greatly beyond its ancient walls. Okay. And by the way, the walls of the city, the wall line that we have right now, only dates from, you know, 800 years ago, 900 years ago, the, the Crusader period. The walls uh, that you see now were, were built um, after uh, 1100 but they were following certain wall lines that existed from more ancient times. So as you'll see in our moving diagram, the dotted lines, which represent the wall lines today, will at some point on some uh, axes converge with the, the lower remnants of walls from the biblical periods. Okay? All right, so, uh, uh, so when, we're, when we're looking at this, we're not considering the huge mega capital that is now Jewish Jerusalem, or the uh, uh, neighborhoods of the older eastern part of the city that would be the Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem, or the Mount of Olives over here, which just looks like roads, but it's actually uh, the Mount of Olives. And, and our Jerusalem center, by the way, is um, uh, right there. I don't have to do that because I have a laser. But... <laughs> Jerusalem center would be right there on the mountain. Right in that area here. Um, in fact, does it say Mormon Center? Yeah, Brigham Young University, right there. See the blue dot? 
Of course it would be blue. <laughs> um, so, but, it, but it's this little thing that we're paying attention to now. Okay? Um, so there it is again. Now, what Nephi probably would have understood, because this was this is traceable in the Bible, is that Jerusalem originally was settled on a small, elongated north-south ridge that is located outside the medieval walls. This was where original Jerusalem was in the Bronze Age. Okay. Only about 10 acres. It had a wall around it, and that's why I've drawn a solid line here. And where you see red is where archaeologists have actually discovered the remains of the ancient walls, going all the way back to about 1800 BC. And in the last decade, they have dug up the huge Gihon spring and pool tower that was part of the eastern uh, uh, water gate area of uh, Jerusalem. And so this was original Jerusalem, also known as Salem, okay? the city that Genesis notes is led by a king named Melchizedek. Um, there is a picture of the underground water spring called the Gihon Spring that, that uh, flows at a thousand gallons an hour and provided the fresh water. That's why Jerusalem was settled, because there was water there, the, the water of life. And anywhere you wanted to settle, you had to have water or you just couldn't live there. Were all those steps in that tavern original? Uh, no, no, this is, this is uh, uh, these steps are from the medieval period. Uh, uh, the, well, actually, these steps are more recent. These are from the last hundred years. But this uh, was buried for many years and non-accessible until about 1900. But this was uh, where ancient Jerusalem got its water. Um, and it had, there was a large um, tower that was built clear back in the Bronze Age, around 1800 BC, protecting the access to this spring from enemy invaders. Now, if you look at a, a uh, aerial uh, photograph of Jerusalem today, that spring is about where that red dot is. And the walls of ancient Jerusalem went around this ridge. And you'll notice here that here are the medieval walls of the old city, and there's the big temple mount right there. So what you're looking at here with the temple mount and the ridge of the ancient city of Jerusalem, well, there's the temple mount, here's the ridge of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And, and interestingly enough, you know, in the picture, just like I portray it, it's totally outside to the south of the medieval Crusader wall line. Uh, in fact, there in, in the dotted line shows you more or less where original Jerusalem was. And I like to mention this to my students in Jerusalem because we, we hear of Jerusalem in Genesis 14. After Abraham rescues Lot from his captors, uh, Abraham stops at Salem, which is the short version of Jerusalem and uh, pays tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who is uh, 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 noted as, uh, as a, a fairly prominent individual. And um, uh, it's very possible that the wall, much of which on the east side has actually been excavated right down to Middle Bronze Age, uh, 1800 BC uh, levels, was a building project of uh, Melchizedek's administration. So there's a lot more than just, you know, um, David and Solomon and Lehi in Jerusalem. You can go all the way back to the beginning. In fact, there is the wall. It was excavated in the 1970s um, and 80s. I actually assisted for a week with the excavation of that when I was about your age. I was in my early 20s as a, a volunteer who had no idea what he was doing. And um, we now regularly take our students on field trips out into Jerusalem uh, to, uh, to visit um, the uh, original bronze slash Iron Age walls around what we now refer to as the city of David. Because this is what Jerusalem looked like not only in 1800 BC. 800 years later, it was the same walls and the same pool, the same tower, when a warrior named David conquered it and made it the capital of his new kingdom. And you read about that in 2 Samuel 5. In the meantime, around 1800 BC, Melchizedek uh, had uh, been uh, the king of the city. This would be in the Middle Bronze Age. We we're even told about the king's garden, or the king's dale, the king's valley, right here, 
uh, where Abraham met with Melchizedek and paid tithing to him. Um, as we say, that would be Middle Bronze Age too, and we even have cuneiform tablets, and, and some of them are actually written in hieroglyphs as well, from uh, Egypt that we call execration texts. And um, here's one of them, when the Egyptians of that age were cursing a Canaanite city, because this was a Canaanite city at that time, Melchizedek was a Canaanite king. Um, the, um, the Egyptians would create little clay dolls. Uh, we probably call them voodoo dolls today. But instead of putting pins into them, they'd write a curse upon them and smash it. By smashing the doll, they gave bad luck to the thing they were doing. Text. That's why we call it an execration text, meaning a condemnation text. Mm -hmm. And the execration texts found in Egypt from this period, okay, note that this city was called Wu Shalimum. And uh, 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 Ru there would be kind of the equivalent of your Jeru. It actually refers to a, a, a city. And Shalimum, if you take off that ending M, you can see Shalim or Salim, Salem. So even the non-biblical documents tell us that the name and, and the identity is, is, is uh, as we find it in, in Genesis. Um, moving hundreds of years ahead, 500 years ahead, in other documents found in ancient Egypt from what we call the Late Bronze Age, around 1350, and by the way, 1350, if you're going with a, with a usable chronology, uh, you probably have, uh, uh, you know, uh, within a decade or two, of that, a little baby being born and put in a basket in the Nile. His name was Moses. Um, but uh, the El Amarna letters mention uh, uh, that Jerusalem is a Canaanite city, and it even names the king. The Bible names the, uh, a king from Middle Bronze Age Jerusalem. The El Amarna letters from Egypt name Abduheba as a Canaanite king in Jerusalem. Now that name's not in the Bible, because late Bronze Age Jerusalem is not talking about in the Bible, because the Israelites are, in, are slaves in Egypt at that time. But um, it's interesting that we have these archaeological documents that kind of help us know even the pre-biblical history of the city, at least glimpses of it. And then um, when Joshua is recorded as coming into the land and conquering the land of Israel, he and his forces fight against coalition that includes the Canaanite king of Jerusalem and his soldiers. And that king is called Adonai Zedek in Joshua 10.3. And that's really interesting to me because Adonai Zedek or Adonai Zedek has the same type of a name root as Malki Zedek or Melchizedek which may indicate that you have dynamic, uh, or pardon me, dynastic name factors in the names of the kings of Bronze Age Jerusalem that last for centuries. Well, at any rate, that's all before David conquers the city. Around 1000 BC, David is said to have taken the fortress of Zion, which is what Jerusalem was also called, Zion, uh, and he refers to it then after that as the city of David. It becomes his new capital. And he expands a pre-existing Canaanite building there into his palace and uh, uh, still is using the water system of Gihon. In fact, his son Solomon is coronated, crowned, at the big plaza there at the Gihon Tower because it's the biggest public area in the city. And you read about that, of course, in the, in the first chapter. But uh, in 2 Samuel 5, David becomes the king of Jerusalem, and now it's an Israelite capital, but it's the same little spur, and that's why we call it the city of David, because 2 Samuel 5 calls it the city of David. Now, this is, uh, if you ever need to go to Jerusalem, you can visit the city of David archaeological park. And you can go down and you can see the remains of walls and buildings that go back 3,000, 4,000 years. It's absolutely amazing what they discovered archaeologically that they decided would be of interest to visitors. So they have arranged it in a visitor-friendly way so that you can go there and uh, you have to pay a small fee, but they have a snack shop. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, 
a, it's a really uh, fun experience to visit the ancient city of David, which is what you see in our Hebrew there. It's Ir David, the city of David. Um, and that's actually David's home. Now, um, my good friend, Professor Elat Mazar of the Hebrew University. Uh, she was the director of the excavations uh, in some of the area of, of the city of David, namely the huge public building that is said by some to be a good candidate for the building in which David resided. And it goes clear back to the earliest uh, uh, of the Iron Age levels. This is what it looked like when it was being excavated. This is a shot actually that she published. Here's her caption. Uh, in the 2005 season. Uh, 2005 is not that long ago. Okay. And in fact, um, the same guys that take uh, the, the aerial shots of my excavation site at Gath, the, the, the Sky Balloons Incorporated, took this shot. Um, and this shows what she excavated. And of course, there are many levels to it. The, the building uh, remains are all jumbled and were used in several different periods. But the earliest foundations of this go back right to uh, the scene between Iron Age 1 and Iron Age 2, right there at 1000 BC. Um, nowadays, they've built a big platform over it, and you can see here's a bunch of BYU students looking down on the remains of the building from ancient city of David in Jerusalem. Very interesting opportunity to visit. And of course, we date these based on the uh, pottery samples that are found in connection with the, um, with the foundations of the city. And this particular type of pottery find, the so-called collar rim jar, dating right there to that end of Iron Age one scene that's around 1000 BC. So uh, the, uh, the uh, scientific evidence is, is fairly good. And it's Elat Mazar herself, a very noted professor at the Hebrew University, and, and as I say, a good friend, who has suggested that this building, this big public building from that period, would be the only uh, uh, viable candidate answering to the description of the house of David that is mentioned in 2 Samuel. So that's kind of fun. But that then becomes the, the beginning of kind of the Israelite story of, of, of Jerusalem, although it had existed for centuries prior to this. Yes? So this is all in the old original city, not like... Yeah, this is not in the old city that, that the visitors did. You have to go to that spur outside okay. to, to get to this. This is outside Dungate in that, in that area that I was mentioning to you. Now, uh, there's a lot more I could show you here. Uh, the uh, purple remains are said to go all the way back to that Iron Age 1, Iron Age 2 seam, and then other remains that were excavated were built on top of them. This, uh, this particular um, uh, house right here in yellow was actually built on top of these remains centuries later and dates from the time of Lehi, from the 7th century BC. So the stratigraphy or the layering is very complicated. And I won't go into it other than to show you that this structure right here probably dates from about the time of David and Solomon, 1000 to 900 BC. And this structure right here, which was built on top of it three centuries later, uh, was destroyed by the Babylonians shortly after 600 BC. And, and, and these are the remains of a house that was built in terraces, steps, on that slope structure, just the way that you build a house on a hillside today in terraces. And um, and there's our students visiting, which I always like to show. There. And uh, here we are again. Now, so so that's where we are right there, and that 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 stepstone structure is represented in the red right there. And probably it was called the Milo that you read about in several places. And Milo means a filling or a foundation. Uh, and David seems to have built it there to support that big public building. Um, and there it is again. With Tom. Um, <laughs> the reason I have to show you this is because this is a picture from that house that dates from the 7th century BC. 7th century BC would be 700 to 600 BC. And lo and behold, what do they find in the house but a little room outside the walls of the main house. It's about this wide. And in the little room is a, a deep pit that is about eight, nine feet deep. And over the pit sat this stone. 
And as you can see, it's very nicely shaped for human use. And it is, it is, a, it is a, a toilet seat from 600 BC. Now, I, I know you, you probably have never thought what did Sarai and Lehi do for toilet facilities. But this is just to show you that they had all the kinds of challenges that we still have and had to come up with solutions to them. And so very often in, um, in uh, houses in Jerusalem, there would be, uh, rather than, than just like in some places that we excavate in the Middle East, where you just go outside and you, you go to the back wall of the house and there's a, you dig a hole right there and you know, it's, a, it's a kind of an open latrine. In Jerusalem, they actually built little, little um, outhouses. And they function more or less like the ones in our national parks today function. They're dry with no plumbing, uh, but but they have uh, you know uh, nice toilet seats around them. So if you ever get to the point where you think, well, I wonder, you know, uh, when Lehi went back to his house and after the shock of his revelation, uh, where he retired to for a few minutes, it might have been a little room <laughs> like that, you know, with with one of those nice carved seats there. Especially because this would be uh, an example from a home that had at least some degree of wealth. Um, I don't know if that really was all that inspiring. Or not, but I hope you're thinking of Lehi and Nephi and Sarai as real people, and, and imagining what you know uh, uh, the aspects of their life would be as they're on the trail to the Valley of Lemuel, or as they lived in Jerusalem, and uh, and what it meant to leave their nice house at Jerusalem behind, because it was a nice house, and it would have had as nice a facilities <coughs> as anyone in Jerusalem at that time. Um, all right. Can you need to stand up for a minute. We've been going now for about an hour, and I got started late. But uh, and, and I don't really want to break for five minutes tonight because I'm, I would really like to try to get to this. But do you need, if anybody needs to stand up and get some air before we just do a little more technology, that's fine. I'm going to have a drink of water.